Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here. I got another Master Duel video for you. So we're coming back to Snake Eye. Uh, I've been wanting to work on my Snake Eye build once again here, and although I've only made a few very minor changes to the list, uh, I'm very satisfied with where uh, my pure Snake Eye list is at right now. In fact, I was just looking at my numbers from my playtest session yesterday. Uh, I played in Diamond and, and had quite a nice win streak there uh, of eight games at one point. And um, I was looking over at Untapped, uh, I was looking over at some of the data here, um, because one of the new features of Untapped now uh, is that it'll, it'll actually tell you your win rate going first versus going second. It can tell you that deck by deck, it can tell you that for the whole season, for a play session. Uh, if you're at all interested in Untapped, which you can use uh, to copy decks here, to keep track of your decks in games, track your stats, uh, feel free to use my affiliate link in the channel below, or in the description below. Uh, and it's a free download, and it also helps support the channel. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, I was looking at those figures, right? Because um, I felt like I was winning a lot of going second games, and sure enough, I had a 66.7 overall win rate with a going second win rate of 83%, well, 83.3 repeating, uh, but over 80% win rate with this build going second. Um, and that's pretty wild, honestly. Uh, this is not even a specifically going second deck, and we're still winning the vast majority. I think that's why I was having success with this deck, uh, even though we were losing the coin flip a lot, is because, especially with a build like this, uh, it doesn't matter a lot of the time, but really, it truly doesn't matter a lot of the time whether you're going first or second. And I really have to emphasize the reason for this is something I've been on about all season long, which is engine to disruption ratio. The more even you can get those numbers, like ideally a 50-50 split of each, uh, the better off you're going to be in a best of one, because that makes you very likely to not only open uh, at least one combo starter, of which this deck has very many, uh, but on top of that, multiple pieces of disruption. Um, I had so many of these going set games where I opened like Valor and C, or Valor and Nib, or, you know, Imperm and Ash, and I'm like, I feel so much better going second when I have two ways to stop my opponent as opposed to just the one, right? So, uh, and it's not even just that. Like, it's not only just the actual, like, hand traps themselves that we have that are really helping us out here. We also are rocking not only the Curry card and Divine Carna, but also the Sinful Spoils of Subversion Snake Eye. Uh, I think that at playing at least one of these two cards is very important. I really like playing both, though, um, because I, I think it really helps to have uh, multiple ways to find a board breaker card and also just having multiple board breaker cards, right? Like, sometimes you're not always able to force an activation on a monster to curry card it, and then you can just push it back into the back row with the uh, Sinful Spoils of Subversion, right? So... Uh, yeah, no, I, I think this build is phenomenal, honestly. I got to my own horn or anything, but uh, like I said, I've been having a ton of success uh, with this particularly pure Snake Eye build. Uh, I've had some people question me being on 3 Poplar and 2 Original Sinful Spoils. Uh, 3 Poplar is really just until Bonfire comes out, right? Once Bonfire comes out, you can definitely go down to 2. I don't think 2 is, like, terrible right now, but Poplar is a 1-card combo starter. In that regard, I kind of don't understand why you wouldn't play 3, unless you just didn't have 3, or if you were we're just copying TCG list and OCG list that are playing too without thinking about the fact that oh yeah they have bonfire right I do think that tends to happen a lot of the time so uh, I think three poplar if you own it is definitely the way to go uh, right now uh, but if you don't have three copies you can definitely get away with just two um, until we get bonfire right well and God only knows what that's gonna be though Two original sinful spoils. I, this one, I, I I don't know what people are on about. I can't fathom being on only one copy of this card for grind games. Uh, true, a lot of the time, the vast majority of the time, you're not going to get into grind games. But um, you know, again, just having this for the because there have been so many games uh, where, or I guess back when I was only playing one copy uh, in older drafts of this deck, there were so many games where I was only playing one copy and I had banished it to search, but I didn't win on that follow up turn. And then on the next turn after that, I was like. Oh, shit, I could really use another copy of this card, actually. So, um, not only that, but, like, opening this card plus, like, any card you can place face up, like, uh, like even, you know, like a Valor or something, uh, you know, that's gonna be plays. So, in that regard, I don't understand why you wouldn't want more copies of the card that gets you plays. Now, once again, when Bonfire comes out and we have a Searcher that gets us plays very, very easily, uh, then, yeah, I could maybe see going down on... I might even still play two copies of this while Bonfire is around, but again, Poplar, you can definitely go down to two when, when Bonfire comes out. In the meantime, though, I really like three and two for my ratios here. Uh, plus, I've seen a lot of the tournament topping builds are on those ratios as well, so...
Um, let's see here. What else is there? I mean, there's not really too much else to say about the list here. Uh, most, for the most part, it is pretty similar to the last one I showed. I think it's only a two card difference in the main and one card difference in the extra. Uh, in the main deck, I did end up taking out the Joel and Lockbirds, putting in, I believe it was a third effect failure and putting back in the one for one. I was testing without one for one for a while and I don't know, I'm still on the fence about this card, honestly. I guess to be fair, there's kind of no reason not to play it if it is just another starter, but this is definitely the worst starter in your deck, not even just because it's limited and um, I just never see this card. Uh, so I, I don't think I've ever like actually used one for one. In all my games playing Snake Eye, I've never actually used this card to start my plays. So. Um, but again, of your starters, it's definitely the worst one. You have to send exactly a monster, so you not only have to have another card, but it doesn't need to be a monster. Um, and on top of that, it's just, it, you know, it's very ashable. Um, and you get minus if it gets ash. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm on the fence about this card still, honestly, one for one. And that might sound really weird. Like, why would you be on the fence about a card like this? But, I mean, I talked about this in the last video, too. But, again, my main points are it's limited, so it hardly ever comes up. I've never actually used this card to start my plays. Um, and, again, it just seems very vulnerable to ash in that regard. Um, the Drolls might not be the best against other meta decks, but they were... Occasionally useful against Max C. Granted, those plays were also very few and far between, so um, I figured the third Valor. Really, my ma my motivation was more to play a third Valor than to get one for one back into the deck. Uh, still walking the triple tax. I tested Droplet for a little while, um, but I, I love triple tax. This card is just so, so good. Um, not even just as a board breaker. I will say, as a board breaker, yeah, Droplet's going to be the better card, but. Um, I'm all about this card's third effect. Dude, like, doing this on turn one is so good, and, like, I can't even tell you how many games that, that third effect has won me by getting to activate it on turn one. Um, because if you have complete knowledge of what's in, a, in, in an opponent's hand, and you know their deck, like, at least halfway decently, you, you have, you know how the rest of the game is gonna play out, right? I mean, of course, barring their top decks, they could still top deck something absolutely insane, but... Um, it, you, you can reasonably assume that you're going to know how the rest of the game is going to play out as a result. Um, and when you can plan for that, like, I mean, there was a reason Pegasus was OP for being able to see his opponent's hand, right? Um, that knowledge, like, you can play around everything your opponent does much, 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 much more easily. Uh, just completely removing guesswork from the duel is, uh, is kind of wild. Uh, in the extra deck, I'm trying out Nightmare Phoenix over Sprite Elf. Yeah, I mean, for me, Sprite Elf, it, it just, it, at the end of the day, I think it is just win more. Um, it's not bad by any means. I would not call Sprite Elf a bad card in this extra deck, but I will say it, it is just very win more. Um, it honestly just didn't really come up for me pretty much at all uh, outside of, you know, doing the turn one combo line uh, and not getting disrupted. I've seen other players, like I've seen opponents in my own duels, uh, utilize Sprite Elf in some pretty neat ways. I don't think it's a bad card. Um, I just, I, I, again, it, it very rarely came up for me, but also I did have situations where I was looking to get rid of a back row, right, uh, with Nightmare Phoenix. Um, or I guess with Nightmare Unicorn, and I was thinking like, oh, if I fight a Nightmare Phoenix, I could just do that first and not have to commit so hard to a Link 3. Um, that's more of like a going second kind of OTK kind of combo line, but um, I don't actually end up summoning Nightmare Phoenix in any of these games. Uh, the vast majority of these games I played with Sprite Elf still in my deck, so um, if you see me summon Sprite Elf at some point, I don't think I do, uh, but if I do, that's, that's why. It's because, again, a lot of these games were played before I made that extra deck swap there. Um, but yeah, like I said, the rest of the build is pretty pretty standard stuff, so let's break it down card by card. I'm actually going to take a sip of water before I do that. Okay, and then we'll see those games. Uh, we're on three Effect Failure, one Jet Synchron, one Curry Card, Divine Carnet. we got three Snake Eye Ash, one Snake Eye Oak, three Snake Eyes Poplar, three Maxi, three Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, two Diabell Star the Black Witch, two... Or sorry, three Diabell Star the Black Witch, uh, two... Snake Eyes, Flamberg Dragon, one Nibiru the Primal Being, one one for one, uh, two Triple Tactics Talent, one Sinful Spoils of Subversion Snake Eye, two Original Sinful Spoils Snake Eye, uh, one Divine Temple of the Snake Eye, we got two Called by the Grave, one Cross Eye Designator, uh, three copies of Wanted, Seeker of Sinful Spoils, and then three Infinite Impermanence, and that is going to do it for our main deck. 
for the extra Gron 1 Formula Synchron, 1 Borload Savage Dragon, 1 Baron de Fleur, 1 Link Karibo, 1 Nightmare Phoenix, 1 Heat to the Fire Charmer Ablaze, 1 IP Masquerina, 1 Dark the Dark Charmer Gloomy, 1 Nightmare Unicorn, 1 Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames, 1 Amphibious Swarmship Ambler Whale, 1 Appaloosa Bow of the Goddess, 1 Axis Code Talker, 1 World Sea Dragon Zealantis, and then finally, 1 Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. Uh, that's gonna do it for our list. Let's see these duels now. All right, so I think for our first game, I'm gonna start with this duel against tier limits. Uh, we are back on ranked ladder for these games, so <laughs> I actually get to know what my opponent's playing without having to watch all the duels ahead of time. Uh, yeah, this is one of our going second games here, uh, and as you can see, this this is exactly this is exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about having ratios here. Um, opening hands, even if I'd had a hand like this going first, I would still be extremely satisfied with this. I mean, ideally, Valor would be, the second Valor would be like a call by or a cross out or an extender, but, um, still, regardless of if I'm going first or second, as long as I have one of my one card starters and then a bunch of other tools to utilize against my opponent, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. So, let's go start with Normal Summon Rhino Heart. I've got two Valors, but I'm going to let him go because I want to get this draw off the max C. I would like to cycle into some more gas or extension if possible. Uh, plus, I can just use the Valor on the kick close, and then if they have more follow up plays, well, I'll just use my other Valor, right? So, I think knowing when to use your hand traps is a very, very important skill that almost nobody talks about or respects, really. It's like. People will be like, oh, well, you opened four, you know, hand trap or three hand traps and a board breaker, so of course you win. Or like, oh, well, the, the, the deck went first instead of three in a gate, so of course they win. Uh, that's not an auto win situation. I've had a lot of games where my opponent has a lot of negates and hand traps, and I still win because uh, they don't play them correctly. So that is absolutely a skill that should be respected. Um, anyway, top decking the original sin. I'm just going to use that on Kickless first things first, uh, just in case the face down card is like Soul Egg or something like that, right? So. I don't want to mess with that. Uh, going to link off the, or I'm going to summon Poplar, get the original send, link it for Link Karibo, then send the Poplar in the spell trap zone for Snake Eye Ash. Uh, you grab another Poplar anyway uh, in this situation until you get super polyed. Uh, it's pretty brutal, so. Yeah, I actually thought this was a different tier limit game where I triple attacked my opponent and saw that they had a super poly and was able to take it, but um, to be fair, I think this duel is a little bit more engaging anyway, where we actually do get super polyed, so. Let's go normal under the Rhino Heart. I'm just going to use my other Valor here um, because I know the Kikolos is in the back row. I don't know what exactly they're trying to fuse for, but it's like, yeah, let's just stop it here. Uh, they do end up having a Shiren in hand, which they're going to use, uh, pitching a Supreme Sea Mare, and they mill two King of the Swamp and a Shadal Beast. Uh, yeah, now even though they didn't mill a Fuser, they still get to overlay for the Time Thief Redoer, uh, which can detach Shiren by its effect, and then that will then allow them to fuse. But. I'm actually okay with this because Time Thief Redoer is going to automatically activate during my standby phase, which means, uh, if nothing else, I'll get to use my Curry Kara here. Alright, they're making the Kaleido Heart, putting back my Link Kribo. That's that's so fine. I, I, I was actually really scared this was going to be like, well, I guess it wouldn't be Roll Close because Kick Close is right here. But they did have King of the Swamps in the graveyard, did they not? They did. I really thought they were going to go for Roll Close. I don't know why you would Kaleido put back Link Kribo. I think that was a misplay on my opponent's part, honestly. Um, like, ha me having Link Rebo, especially in a situation like this, is not really that big of a deal. And Roll Close is going to stop a lot more things. Like, for example, here, um, if my opponent had made Roll Close instead of Kaleida Heart, I think I would have had to have used Curry Kara to battle over the Redoer, and then crash it, the Curry Kara, into the Kaleida Heart, and then go for the, uh, DML Star, but... So yeah, like I said, um, I'm just going to Curry Kari, the opponent's Time Thief Redoer, right away as my first action. Especially because it did take a spell card that would have allowed them to draw. Um, oh yeah, they have a call by here for the Poplar. That's 100% fine. Um, original Sinful Spoils, if you... Okay, so if your opponent uses the Graveyard effect of Original Sinful Spoils and you call by whatever monster they target, uh, the card will still actually resolve. Because what it says is... Base your card from your graveyard, target a Snake Eye or Diabelle Star Monster in your graveyard, add a level 1 Fire Monster from your deck to your hand, then place the targeted monster on the bottom of the deck. So I think a lot of people think that placing the, the monster on the bottom of the deck is an and if you do effect that will stop the search, but it's actually the other way around, uh, because this card is stupid and broken. <laughs> uh, you search and then you place the monster. So, to be fair, you know, call buying Poplar does still stop me from using its effects this turn, but we don't need Poplar to combo off here. Uh, I'm going to Oak and bring back Ash, and then I'll just Ash for another Ash, just because, like, whatever. It doesn't matter what I get here. Um, 
Diabelle, again, I'm just going to set a Wanted, because it doesn't matter at all what I get here. I did actually misplay here. I shouldn't have used Jet Synchron, because um, I don't need it as a material, and I should have kept the card in my hand to pitch off of Nightmare Unicorn, right? Um, I could have Nightmare Unicorn to wave the Gerbera, that wouldn't have given my opponent a draw, which actually could have been potentially like a hand trap or something that would have outed me. So, granted, they're going to they're gonna uh, concede here before I even get that far in the combo line, but... Um, yeah, no, so, like, didn't need to bring back Jet Synchron, could have spun back the Guru, I not had to worry about a draw. Technically, a very minor misplay, but as you can see, uh, one that did not overall affect the outcome of the duel. So, um, let's look at our next game. Okay, I wanted to get at least one mirror match in here, <laughs> because, I don't know, whenever you're playing the best deck of the format, well, I guess for me, whenever I'm making a video playing the best deck of the format, and I don't have at least one mirror match, it just always feels like punching down to me, but... Uh, yeah, here we go. Yet another going second game. And as you can see, yet another flawless hand if I had gone first or second. This is exactly, exactly again what I'm talking about here with these ratios. Like, deck building affects your games like so, so, so much more than I think a lot of people realize. Um, like the way that I have built my deck here for best of one exactly um, is like definitely the reason why uh, we are able to have an over 80% win rate going second year. So here we're actually going to get triple tacked. Uh, again, I think this card is insanely good. Uh, we're going to get triple tacked after we maxi. Um, to be fair, that was a bit of a risky play for me to maxi in the main phase. The reason I maxied when I did, so you might be wondering like, okay, why would you maxi during the main phase if you were just going to do it before, you know, your opponent did um, the summon? And to be fair... Ah, uh, it's because they wanted during the main phase. I was going to say, if they'd wanted during the draw phase, that would have definitely been a misplay on my part. But it looks like they saved wanted for the main phase because they're playing triple tax. So, very well played on my opponent's part. And that is a situation in which you do want to uh, make sure that you're <laughs> using wanted at the right time. Uh, now, here, I'm just the luckiest player in the world. So, I'm just going to pick up the call by that they put back anyway off the top of my deck. Um, and when they put that call by, I'm like, okay, so they have maxi. Which they do. It's like... If you see a hand like mine where I have Poplar and Wanted, well, that's the other thing, too, about that triple tack and why would, I think they had to take Call by there, right? You can't take Wanted or Poplar because they're both, they both represent plays. But if you have Maxine hand, taking the Call by makes a lot more sense. But again, um, much to my opponent's dismay, uh, I'm just the best duelist in the world and I just ripped Call by off the top of my deck. I uh, could normal summon Poplar opponent's going to use an Imperm on it. Um, I, I think that's a misplay, unless their other back row is another Imperm. I think they really should wait for Snake Eye Ash. I struggle to think of a lot of situations in which you would Imperm or Ash Blossom or Valor before they Snake Eye Ash in the mirror. Yeah, the other card ends up being Called By, which, like, I don't know. I feel like if you're going to Call By... Like, yeah, they stopped the spell Trap Search, but, like... You know my hand. You know that I already have access to Diabelle and Original Sin. Like... I guess does me having Divine Temple really make that much of a difference, you know, that you would want to Imperm the Poplar that you were going to call by anyway? Again, I really think they should have saved the Imperm for the Snake Eye Ash here, but... There you go, that one was more of a quicker duel, but um, again, wanted to show a mirror match, wanted to show another going second game, uh, and also wanted to show how... Uh, again, uh, how good our hands are looking uh, with the deck ratios we've got here. Uh, let's see the next one. Okay, going into our game against Cash Tira here. Cash Tira definitely being the nemesis of Snake Eye with their ability to banish. And we are going to see an Arise Heart at some point in this game. However, we do have the Nib in our hand, so I'm not like the most concerned. We're also going to get Max Seed right away during the draw phase. So. This is something that I meant to elaborate on in the last duel, too. Uh, another reason why I didn't maxi during my opponent's draw phase. I see a lot of people doing this in this meta. And I understand why. Like, not only does Diabelle summon without starting a chain link, but so do all the Cash Shira monsters. And uh, obviously Diabelle is everywhere, and Cash is relatively popular, more so than it's been uh, in some previous seasons. So I get it. I understand why people are maxing during the draw phase. I just, I don't think it's right, not even against Snake Eye, I don't think it's right to do it against, even if you know you're up against Snake Eye. Um, because if you max during the draw phase, like, especially against this deck in particular, like, you give your opponent so much more opportunity to plan out their turn, right, around your max C. Like, for example, if my opponent had waited, I would have normal summoned Snake Eye Ash, added Poplar, activated Poplar's effect, uh, and then they would have maxied one guaranteed gotten the draw uh, and two left me in a situation where I no longer have the Snake Eye Ash in my hand 
when they maxed it in the draw phase, then I was like, okay, so I can just pop Lair for the Divine Temple and then uh, set up my Flamberge and then just pass, right? So I think that is something that it is important to keep in mind, right? Uh, the other big thing to keep in mind when utilizing Maxi is the quality of your hand. The reason I played Maxi after my opponent added the Diabelle in that last game, right, was because I knew my hand was already good and I didn't need to actually get a draw. If they just ended their turn, I would have been fine with that, so. Uh, speaking of being fine with our opponent's turn, yeah, they're doing cash share stuff. I really, I don't care. <laughs> I've got Nib. I've also got uh, Subversion, so even if they somehow have plays after I Nib them, I can still just push back whatever they play, so. Like, I, I could not be less concerned about what my opponent's doing right now, to be totally honest. Like, I'll just let them play it all out, because, like, the more they play here, the more resources they waste, and the harder it will be for them to potentially be able to come back at some point, right? So. I don't know why they pop the field. I, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, yeah, no, popping the field spell is right there. If you're, yeah, if you're about to make a Rise Heart and you're not concerned about my actual monsters, then I, I do think that is correct. Yeah, they were about to end the main phase and go to battle. That's why we nibbed here. And because it uh, nib tributes everything at once, uh, everything does go to the graveyard, even though a Rise Heart was on the field. Uh, once again, my Poplar is going to get called by, and I really don't end up caring that much, honestly. Um, like, it's a bit of a nuisance, but a lot of the time... Like, I genuinely think that the Flamberg Dragon would have probably been the better target to call by. Because um, playing out a turn without Flamberg is a lot more intimidating of an idea than playing out a turn without Poplar. Especially in a situation like this, right? Uh, top decking Diabell. I'll shotgun it during the draw phase, because I don't have a triple attack in hand. I'm going to pitch the Snake Eye Ash for the Diabell. That looks really weird, but... I already have Oak in my hand, so that's already going to want to be my normal summon just to get it in rotation. And then, yeah, I can just bring back Ash and then activate Ash's effect. And uh, I'm going to get Curry Kari here because, of course, Poplar got hit with the Called By, so I can't use its effects this turn. Um, but the Curry Kari will be good for any potential follow up plays I might need. So I'm going to use Oak to sack itself and Ash. Uh, this is going to cause them to get hit by the Called By, but I do also have the um, Original Sin face down as well. Yeah, so I can just do this. It, and then I'll use that Snake Eye Ash effect to get my other Flamberge out. This does cost me the ability to, like, actually link it off for a summon, right? But I can use the... I probably should just use Flamberge's effect for the token. I don't know why I put Ash in a spell trap and then also use the spell on the token. That was a little bit weird, but not that big of a deal. But it's got Ogre and Ash Boston. That's going to be a Baron de Fleur, which is not enough. That is not going to be enough to stop me here. Um, cause it's like, they can pop my Flamberge, I'm gonna activate. Well, actually, I get to ch I even get to cheat. oh, this is why I put Snake Eye Ash in the Spell Trap Zone. So that way, on my opponent's turn, I could summon it out with a quick effect, and then, uh, still be able to, um, and then have plays next turn. Okay, that makes sense, that makes a little more sense. So yeah, they're gonna use the Omni on the Flamberge, which is like so 100% fine, because now they don't have it for... Uh, the follow-up original sin that's in my graveyard too, right? And if they activate Baron's effect for like um, a Kashira monster, then we still have the current card to help deal with that, which is actually exactly what they do. Uh, they're just going to grab the Fenrir here, but like I said, I'm just going to use original sin, uh, put back my Flambridge into the deck, add a Stink Eye Ash, and they also know I have current card, Divine Carnet. Um, it's funny because I actually had a coaching session on my Patreon recently, um, where one of the questions that that I got asked was. Um, isn't it bad if you are adding cards to get a really strong out because your opponent will know that you have it? Um, and yeah, a lot of the time it, it's not great to give your opponent information of, hey, I'm about to use this really strong card against you. But there's also a lot of the time where you can use that information like as a weapon, like offensively. Um, and that's kind of what I was doing with adding Curry Kara. I mean, I added it earlier because I thought it was like the right thing to do as like just the best card to add in that situation. But also on top of that, adding Curry Car earlier in the game definitely served as like a warning message to my opponent. It's like, hey, even if you do come back, I still got this that you have to think about too. Um, and that can really screw with your opponent's head while they're making their plays. Like they get a lot, they might get a lot more pessimistic about even trying to out your board because they might be like, oh, well, even if I do, they just have the Curry Car in hand anyway, right? Like it provides that sense of inevitability that like. You show them this card, you're like, hey, because of this card, I am going to win this duel at some point. Uh, it's just up to you when that is. <laughs> so, 
Uh, good stuff. All right, uh, we got one more game to watch. Let's see it here. Okay, for our final game, uh, let's see a duel against Labyrinth. I was actually kind of surprised. I was looking at Master Duel meta recently, and of the decks submitted there, Lab is like in a landslide, the second most submitted deck. I guess a lot of people just like it. Well, transaction rollback. Never mind. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so, yet another going second game. This time against Lab. We definitely do not like going second against this deck. So, you might notice that my opponent activated Nadir Servant and sent Kikolos, right? Uh, and now they're going to activate Kick Close, and I'm still not using Ash Blossom. You may be wondering, like, is it really not right to Ash Blossom against any of that? When I saw Nadir Servant, uh, I did actually, I was a little tempted to Ash Blossom this, because I, my first thought was Stun, but then I thought about other decks that use this card, and I'm like, okay, Branded and Lab are actually the two biggest decks that use this card, and they have far better Ash Blossom targets, plus, even if it does end up being stun, they might still have like a pot of something or a card of demise that I can Ash Blossom later, right? Uh, so they sent Kikolos and milled five. And again, I'm thinking about like Branded, I'm thinking about Lab, and I'm like, it's a little annoying if those decks mill five, but those decks still have stronger Ash targets, so. And then the, uh, the Kikolos mill did confirm that my opponent is in fact going to be on Labyrinth, so. Very glad I saved the Ash Blossom. Uh, that's a very great example of how just having general deck knowledge can be very helpful like one of the biggest questions i get asked a lot is when do i use ash blossom and like it's so situationally dependent right like you know because even if i tell you like okay against branded use it against brand diffusion against lab use it against the welcome trap cards you still have game seats like this where your opponent's doing the nadir servant and the kick close smell and you gotta decide like is the ash blossom actually worth using here um, and again, having just knowledge of the meta, of other decks, of how they're built, of how they play, uh, is going to be the best, like, I, I don't know, I, I really do wish I could give people just like a combo guide video, but for when to use hand traps, and to some extent you can, but not to the same degree that like a combo guide will show you like, you know, how to play out your, your hand, right? Like, disruption is a lot more tricky. Uh, anyway, I've got the Ash Blossom for their welcome here. They have another Imperm for my Dark, uh, which is completely fine. I mean, it's it's annoying for sure, but I'm going to attack the face down. And here's the thing. I'm like, okay, there's no reason not to battle this face down because I can either destroy it or if it, I can't destroy it, I can just push it with the original Sin. Very glad to have gotten the Stovey off the field here. It means they can't just, yeah, use Stovey with the other card in their hand to set up another Welcome Lab, which would have really screwed me over here. Um, but instead, now I just have, like, a very, very easy comeback play here, right? I just original sin for the Snake Eye Ash, and I can also the Snake Eye Ash, and then they concede. And even if that last card in their hand had been like a, well, it wouldn't have been Valor, um, or, or Imperm, because they would have set Imperm. But even if that had been an Ash Blossom against my Snake Eye Ash, I have both Diabelle and Triple Tag. I could have Triple Tag draw to you, and then Diabelled, and then easily won from there. So. Yeah, that's going to go ahead and do it for these duels. Um, yeah, again, big emphasis point I got to make here with this video is uh, ratios. Ratios, ratios, ratios. They're so very important. Um, if you can get your hand trap to engine ratio as close to 50-50 as possible, uh, for a lot of decks, especially ones that do like one card combos, um, like Super Heavy Samurai, this is true of Math Mech, I would build, uh, I would take a similar deck building philosophy to Math Mech, right? Um, that the closer we can get to 50-50, I think for best of one ranked ladder, especially, is the way to build your deck. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna do it. Like I said, let's move now to our outro. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video, that means a lot to me. Uh, it's also a great way to support the channel, so thank you very much for it in that way as well. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways, uh, like the very special patrons that I am thanking here, uh, you can do so by checking out some of the links in the description, one of those goes to the Patreon, uh, where you can join these fine folk and support the channel that way. I do post daily content over on Patreon, so uh, you do get something for support there and if you're interested I also have a coaching tier option uh, as well details again will be on patreon in the link below uh, also in the description linked below is my twitch page where I stream uh, a few times a week you can go ahead and check that out follow or subscribe over there uh, if you ever want to catch me live uh, you'll also find my second YouTube channel if you feel like subscribing over there to watch some of the twitch vods as well as some additional uh, non-yu-gi-oh related content that I make over there. Uh, again, 
any of those links you want to check out is all a great way uh, of supporting. But again, even if you don't do that, just watching was also a fantastic way to support. And once again, I have to thank you so very much. But uh, in any case, this is Hexlex. I'm going to be signing out and I'm hoping you have a fantastic day.